Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's event organized by ASEA, the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. My name is Anna Gumbau. I am a climate and energy journalist, and I'm going to be your moderator in today's discussion. The event that brings us here today is titled Getting Zero Emission Trucks on the Road. What is needed? What are the enabling conditions required for that to happen? What is the policy framework that we need for to make it possible? Today we'll be hearing from policymakers, from industry, from researchers, from academia, from customers as well, to understand better what is needed to decarbonize such an important sector and really embrace zero emission trucks on European roads. You will also be a part of this uh, conference uh, today. Um, we just have a poll, uh, slide the poll running that we are starting to get a few answers already. Uh, when we are asking you, um, does the uh, ongoing uh, the regulation from uh, CO2 standards for cars and vans that has just been adopted by the uh, European institutions be the same for trucks uh, as well? Uh, this conference is organized in the framework of the new CO2 regulations for trucks that the European Commission is meant to be presenting soon. So today we're going to be, one of the questions that we are going to be discussing is, should the regulations be the same for cars and vans as for trucks? Uh, we're going to be discussing this with our panel of uh, speakers today, but we would like to also hear your thoughts as well and provide this first room for discussion among ourselves. So without further ado, let's get today's event started. I'm delighted to introduce our panel of uh, speakers that are joining us today here in uh, the studio in Brussels. We have with us uh, Martin Lundstedt. He's the chairman of ASEA's Commercial Vehicle Board and the CEO of the Volvo Group. Thanks a lot for being with us. Good morning. Thank you. Good to see you, Anna. And also with us is Antonia Gawel. She's the head of climate change at the World Economic Forum. Antonia, thanks for being with us. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Antonia, before we get the debate started, I think it would be great to hear from you. What is the link between the World Economic Forum and uh, zero emissions uh, trucks, that, uh, this topic that brings us here together today? What can you tell us about it? Yeah, no, absolutely. So the World Economic Forum, for those who may not know us, we're a international institution for public-private collaboration. So that means we work between businesses, governments, civil society, to really look at some of the pressing challenges that face us today. One of the biggest focuses for us is climate change. So how are we gonna accelerate uh, driving the climate transition forward? And in doing that, really, we look at a couple different dimensions. So one is an ambition. So ambition, what we know is that we're not where we need to be in terms of really achieving the Paris Agreement. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So how do we close that gap? So how do we work with governments as, and businesses really to drive that uh, ambition up? The second though, and I think importantly, and we'll talk about here, is how do you actually deliver on that ambition? How do you move from setting targets in 2050 to looking at 2030, to then figuring out what needs to happen today to actually move that forward? So this this is where I think this conversation is critical. So we know that this particular sector is important when it comes to CO2 emissions um, globally, but also specifically in, in Europe. And a large portion of that also comes from the medium and, and heavy um, duty trucking sector. So really just briefly two key areas for us. One is uh, an initiative called the First Movers Coalition, and this is really about pulling demand. So how do we create the demand by setting specific purchasing targets by 2030 for these types of uh, trucks? So looking at medium and heavy duty, aiming for 100% um, medium duty vehicles, 30% uh, for heavy by 2030 to help pull the, the technology and the industry forward. And then secondly, we also need to work across the entire ecosystem to actually deliver the full-scale transformation. So this is an initiative we have called road freight zeros. So how do we really work across the entire value chain of actors, again, to get through the nitty gritty of, okay, how are we actually gonna do this? What financing do we need? What infrastructure do we need? What policy do we need for this conversation and our engagement here, but also what are the partnerships that we need with our, our, our partners, collaborators, stakeholders in the business sector to really deliver on these results? So I think on you know one ambition, we have to do more, but then we really need to do the hard work to figure out how we get there. 
Thanks a lot, Antonia. So really taking a holistic approach in delivering on, on these challenges that we are going to be uh, discussing uh, today. So. Well, um, we just started getting the first uh, answers to our, our poll that's been running, and an overwhelming majority of you believe that uh, CO2 regulations for cars and vans should not be the same as the ones for trucks. We have some 67, 68% of you that, um, that disagree that they should be, uh, there should be the same regulations. There's an 18%, 19% of you now that uh, agree that they should be the same. And there's 14% of you who don't know. And that's, I think, exactly what we are here for today, to try to disengrain a little bit uh, what's happening in, uh, in this sector, understand the context and also the uh, policies uh, needed. So if you would like to join the discussion also on Twitter, we're going to have the hashtag zero emission trucks. So join the conversation also on social media. And you will also be able to ask uh, questions to our panelists uh, throughout the event via Slido. We are going to have uh, the chance to answer at least, uh, at least a few of them. So uh, keep them coming. And we're going to see how many we can uh, address as part of uh, this uh, discussion today. So. We would like to start with the first video that will help us uh, set the scene a little bit on uh, why this uh, topic uh, matters uh, so much. And for that, we have some first thoughts that we got from Mr. Johan Rockström. He is director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. So on with the video. We're not making the progress required. Global emissions continue rising, despite all the pledges and the Glasgow Climate Pact, where over 110 countries have pledged net zero pathways with the aim of cutting emissions almost by half by 2030. Well, this is what has to happen globally, cutting emissions by half each decade to have any chance of holding the Paris Accord to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. The United Nations Environment Program UNEP's emission gap report shows recently that we're still following a catastrophic pathway that takes us to 2.8 degrees Celsius by the end of year 2100. One month ago, we published a major scientific assessment showing that four big systems on planet Earth are at risk of crossing their tipping points already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Greenland Ice Sheet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, tropical coral reef systems across the entire planet Earth, and abrupt thawing of boreal permafrost. We are truly driving along a very dangerous road. It is therefore so important that the European commercial vehicles manufacturers have agreed to lead the way in the transformation towards fossil fuel-free transport. The recent agreement, developed in dialogue between ASEA and science at the Potsdam Institute, concludes that if the world needs to reach net zero emissions by 2050, this implies that by 2040, all new commercial vehicles sold on the market must be fossil fuel free. This is a major North Star for the entire industry. But it goes well beyond that. With the industry stepping up and investing in battery electric vehicles, hydrogen powered trucks, and in the transition, biofuel run transport, it requires that policy steps up and matches the investments in charging infrastructure, regulations, economic policies, and social campaigns. The industry cannot do this alone. But the commercial vehicle industry plays a disproportionately important role in a successful transformation to decarbonize economies for two reasons. One, delivering goods is at the core of all sectors in society. For companies in manufacturing, retail, food, construction, you name it, all need zero carbon trucks to meet their scope one, two, and three climate targets. Trucks are at the backbone of any modern society. And two, commercial vehicles is considered a difficult to abate sector. If the heavy commercial truck industry can succeed in transforming to battery electric and hydrogen electric transport, then this sends a very strong signal to all easy and also difficult to abate sectors. It is possible. We can accelerate the path towards a zero carbon powered modern world.
So we just heard from Mr. Rockstrom about the pledge that all new trucks sold uh, will be fossil free by 2040, which is a major North Star for the uh, entire industry. Um, Martin, maybe I could start with you with the first question. What does fossil free mean uh, on the first place? Because I believe that not everyone will have the same uh, definitions on that. No, but fossil free means obviously that uh, we have uh, zero emissions when it comes to CO2 to start with, but also to other uh, type of emissions. And, and uh, we are working then with a number of pathways in order to reach that. You heard uh, Professor Rockstrom talking about, uh, of course, battery, electric and fuel cell or hydrogen powered fuel cell electric uh, trucks. But also in the meantime, we need to continue in the pathway of uh, uh, combustion energies, but based on renewable fuels then, mm -hmm. uh, biofuels uh, in the transition, but also we see uh, opportunities for hydrogen, for example. So uh, very ambitious, but necessary. And that's the reason why we are also cooperating with the Potsdam Institute to, to make this uh, happen and to bring in science, because there are a lot of opinions, but we need to have science in order to make the right choices. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. And so you've mentioned uh, the, the ambitious character of, uh, of these targets. I would like to hear from you, Antonia. What do you make of this objective? Is it uh, very ambitious? Is it feasible? Is it perhaps not ambitious um, enough? Uh, I remember recalling a, a study recently that said that actually zero emissions drugs are going to become more cost effective already from around 2035. So what do you make about uh, this objective? I mean, I think Johan has put it very well on a number of occasions. What we're looking at is what's necessary in order to keep the global temperature rise at no more than above 1.5 degrees. And he has said it very clearly, this is not uh, a politically negotiated ambition. It is science. It's a physical boundary beyond which we will start hitting. And we are already starting to hit a number of tipping points. So you know, the translation of that ambition then into sector specific targets becomes really critical, right? So I think the objective of moving to 100% by, by 2040 um, is an ambition. But it's not to say that that shouldn't necessarily be moved forward if we have the ability to bring the technology costs down and scale the infrastructure um, even faster. And so I think that's where this role of, one, on one hand, the commitments and the ambition of the industry, but also the, the scale of ambition of the policy and regulation, as well as the supporting investments in, in things like infrastructures. So what we know, for example, is that we need um, something between 50 and $60 billion investment in infrastructure by 2030 in order to be able to scale these types of solutions. So you have to, one, yes, set the ambition high, but then bring behind that ambition a whole suite of supporting uh, elements in order to actually accelerate it. So I would say you know, the ambition should always be higher than what is technically possible today. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve the system transformation, the innovation we're, we're looking for. So we need to set that, that North Star, that ambition high, but then work incredibly hard to back it up with all of the different elements that are necessary to actually bring the cost down and shift the system as as quickly as possible. And maybe once and for all also, I think it's important to discuss, I mean, uh, that trucks uh, uh, and also buses, by the way, they are not big cars. I, I think often, and, uh, and I was really uh, glad to see also the, the question here to start with, I mean, regarding regulations and, and how we should think about it. First and foremost, I mean, uh, trucks, uh, buses, they are part of uh, production and value chains that are professional. Uh, it is about obviously uh, total cost operation for, for uh, the transporters in order to be competitive. But it's also about uptime, it's, it's, it's a 24-7 operation. It is about reliability, it's about safety. Uh, it is about, I mean, producing enormous amount of mileage, uh, utilizing these products maybe 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the available time. Uh, so so I, I think we need really to have that uh, in mind when we talk about how should we think about uh, the decarbonization of, uh, of a professional industry like this. Uh, the good news is that our customers and customers' customers really think a lot about it. And uh, if, if you think about the competitiveness also, I mean, 75% uh, of um, freight uh, transport today in Europe, for example, uh, is done on the road. Uh, and the reason for that is, of course, uh, flexibility, it is about uh, efficiency, it is about about uh, really connecting different uh, uh, industries together, right? And, and in order to, uh, to, to continue to drive this, we must understand that more transport will be needed, but it needs to be considerably more uh, sustainable. So, so when we have been uh, now cooperating uh, in this um, uh, cooperation with, with Potsdam, we have been taking the stance saying that uh, 
logistics and transportation is something that society is really needing in order to be successful. We know that there is a clear relation between GDP development and actually or prosperity as we, uh, that we uh, always have been measuring prosperity in, in GDP uh, with actually how efficient logistics we have. Now we need to add on to this uh, prosperity parameter, obviously the sustainability parameter. And that's the reason why we have said move away as quick as possible from the fossil based uh, system from the brown plot, uh, platform and move into the green platform. And how do we do that then? Uh, yes, we have said that. Uh, there are a number of factors, uh, and, and that has been coming out clearly in the cooperation that we have had uh, together with Potsdam, ASEA, and all the truck manufacturers uh, together. Uh, that is about, of course, the technology when it comes to the trucks uh, and buses. Uh, it is about uh, the infrastructure, and it is about the green generation of um, energy, and it is, of course, also about um, uh, how do we drive uh, the transformation so we can accelerate to uh, uh, Antonia's point here because we are of the same opinion the sooner we can actually accelerate the better it is for everyone and we see also this S-curve transformation happening now in a number of the segments such as um, uh, city distribution, uh, waste collection, uh, regional distribution, ports, terminals, etc., where it is easier to get this equation together. But we also know that there are incentives and clear drivers needed, both from the corporate sector but also from uh, the public sector. So, uh, uh, I mean, when we are talking about this together in ASEA, we are still competitors. But this requires really a, a joint effort to, to make all these parameters happening and, and uh, science and also other actors will play a very important role. We are very happy that we have a forward leading position here. This is really the scale of the challenge, right? That uh, we need to decarbonize, we need to move fast in reducing our emissions, but transport at the, at the end of the day is still going to continue growing, right, Antonia? Um, what, are, what are some, some thoughts on, on, uh, on what Martin has said? I mean, I think, you know, the, the point has indeed been made that transport is a critical part of how our economy functions and how our systems um, work, right? So, so that, is, that is the reality. The question, though, exactly is how do you shift that whole system? How do you shift the system, which isn't about only um, thinking about the end piece, which is the decarbonization of uh, the trucks or, or the vehicles themselves. It's about thinking about all of the connected elements, right, which have already been mentioned. It's about the power systems, right? How are we reinforcing and decarbonizing the entire grid and all of the power systems, not only to support decarbonization of the rest of the economy, but also then to think about quite specific specifications that will be required for the trans transformation of the medium and heavy um, duty vehicles, which is different from what's required for on-site charging at a home, which is different for the type of electricity that you need to decarbonize um, you know, urban centers. So I think this focus on, yes, the end game, of decarbonizing the the technology itself, but also really the entire system that needs to flow into that solution. Um, that's where you know for us a focus really needs to be. I will also say though that different business models are also ones that should be explored. We talk a lot about the circular economy. How do we make everything more efficient? How do we change the way in which we are not necessarily owning, procuring these types of assets, but thinking about different business models to, to sort of uh, you know, pay for service and lease? Does that transform actually the way that we use these types of systems as well? So not just changing the status quo, thinking differently about the transport sy system system so that actually maybe we move to a much more material efficient system while we decarbonize as well. So I think it's, it's both of those things um, because otherwise we won't really achieve the scale of uh, transformation that we need. We can't just keep increasing demand um, and assume we can catch up. Thanks, Antonia. Um, before we move to the next uh, next section of um, of the of the event or next uh, video uh, speaker, uh, we already received our first question on Slido related to uh, what we've been just discussing in terms of the technologies, in terms of the fuels. Hans Kohl is asking, what role should renewable fuels, which uh, Martin you have m just mentioned, play in decarbonizing road transport? What are your views on that? 
Uh, first and foremost, I think maybe to take a step back, uh, we cannot afford not utilizing all means that are uh, possible to do in this uh, in this uh, journey. Uh, as we heard Johan Rock, uh, Rockström saying, it, it is urgent. Uh, we all need to contribute. Uh, when it comes to the technology for uh, the truck in itself, um, uh, I think it's worthwhile remembering because we are talking about certain technologies if they were the future. They are here and now. We are in serious production in Europe for medium and heavy duty trucks, battery electric. We are in serious production, medium and heavy duty trucks when it comes to um, uh, engines with uh, biofuels. Uh, we are continuing to, to, uh, to actually deploy that. We are soon following also with fuel cell, i.e. hydrogen powered electric vehicles. Uh, I'm talking for the whole industry. Uh, we, are not, we are not actually cooperating when it comes to technology, obviously, but I know that everyone sees those different tracks. Uh, so uh, that will continue to be pursued. And since we are talking about 2040 as a global target of having fossil free uh, deliveries, not only for Europe and not only for North America, Asia, etc., for the whole global uh, transportation system, we really need to play in these different fields. Battery electric, fuel cell electric, uh, internal combustion engines based on renewable fuels. Uh, so everyone listen carefully, renewable fuels, including also hydrogen. Because the application range is enormous when it comes to geographies, when it comes to weight, when it comes to different applications. A truck is not a truck. It is a specific made product for the end user when it comes to different type of requirements including then uh, the propulsion system. And then on top of that, as Antonia alluded to, we need to have a coordinated view when it comes to uh, the, the fuel infrastructure, including then el electricity and charging, etc. So we will see all of them. Uh, they are important. The promise that we have to keep is, of course, accelerate the fossil free transportation uh, system. Right. So we need to move now to our next point of the discussion, which is the uh, policy contest. How does the pledge of uh, fossil free uh, trucks uh, by 2040 fit in the EU's policy context? Now, we'd like to hear from the mastermind of the European Green Deal, uh, the executive vice president of the European Commission, Mr. Franz uh, Timmerman. So on with the video. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. This is a good moment to discuss getting zero emissions trucks and buses onto our roads. Just a few weeks ago, Europe reached a deal to ensure that all newly sold cars and vans on our continent are zero emission by 2035. This would not have been possible without the many car makers who saw the need for change, who saw the need to lead their industry into a clean future and who jumped on that opportunity. The deal on CO2 standards for cars and vans is a win for citizens. It will bring more zero emission models at more affordable prices. The deal will also create future-proof jobs. There will be no lack of job opportunities from battery engineering to software. The challenge is to bring workers from the jobs that may disappear to the ones that will be created. But today you will be discussing trucks and buses and also in this area we see the commitment to change and the same need for a crystal clear, predictable direction for companies, customers and employees. Especially now, during this energy crisis, we need more fossil f fuel free trucks and buses and we need them as fast as possible. The models are ready. What we see on uh, vehicle shows around the continent is amazing. Electric and hydrogen trucks models are being presented and the race to make the best ones is on. Now we need the right framework to get them onto our roads. We are preparing a proposal for stronger CO2 standards for trucks, coaches and buses. My aim is to get that proposal around the turn of the year. Getting more zero emission models made is especially important for trucks and buses. While citizens buy their car, you know, mostly with their hearts, freight companies buy their trucks with a calculator. And cities buy their buses knowing that taxpayers have their calculators for a responsible city budget. And we know that ambitious, realistic CO2 standards drive the development of more and thereby also cheaper zero emission vehicles. In parallel, we need to make sure that our roads are ready. 
a first step is for the European Parliament and the Council to confirm ambitious targets for the rollout of charging and hydrogen refueling infrastructure for trucks and buses. In the context of Repower EU plan, we ask member states to carefully plan their energy grid so that there is enough space for zero emission freight and passenger transport from depots to safe parking spots along the highways. Let me finish by stressing one thing. Take the zero emission buses. We are aware that there is tough competition in industry when they take part in city tenders of such buses, including from outside Europe. But cities are moving towards buying zero emission buses only, and they are doing that very fast. By 2030 for most, even by 2025 for some. Knowing that this demand is there and it's growing, the worst answer is to delay the readiness of European industry for this competition. The best is to allow them to ramp up the supply of zero emission models themselves. With that focus, the road ahead for industry, customers and citizens is indeed a stronger and better one. You can count on my full commitment to make the journey to clean mobility comfortable and manageable for everyone, leaving no one behind. Our doors are always open to discuss how to get there and I wish you fruitful discussions today. Thanks to the Executive Vice President Timmermans for sharing some thoughts uh, with us. I would like to pick up on a couple of quotes that uh, Mr. Timmermans has said. The first of them says that uh, the models for fossil-free heavy-duty vehicles are uh, ready. But what are the obstacles for its, uh, for its scale-up? Uh, An Antonia, what are your thoughts on that? So I'll answer your question in just a second, but I also just want to kind of pick up on the positive messaging, I think that that um, Mr. Timmermans has has shared, the the ambition and the willingness to collaborate, I think, is critical, and and that sort of position and approach is really key. The other dimension is is that this is indeed a global opportunity, right? So yes, it's a European opportunity, but it's also a global one, right? And and yes, sort of these types of policies are are needed and recommended, but also the global collaboration behind this is increasing. So just one quick um, positive development in this space is that coming out of COP, there was also a global MOU signed by over now 26 countries, 70 supporting actors to really move towards the same objective that we heard here. So moving towards 100% um, of a zero emission fleet by 2040. So I'm saying that because yes, there are barriers and there are obstacles, but there's such an overwhelming recognition that this is possible and that we need to do this, irrespective of what I wouldn't call necessary barriers, but requirements to success, right? So what are perhaps the two requirements to success? We talked a little bit about them already. One is um, the ability to kind of get the technology uh, scaled, which also requires for prices to come down, which will naturally happen as technology innovates, right? So as you innovate, as you grow scale, prices will decrease. So this is one thing. It can be accelerated through different kinds of incentives, be it subsidies um, or, or tax incentives or the like. So that's one. The second we also already talked about, which is the infrastructure and all of the ecosystem around um, this transportation um, business, which will also just be necessary to deliver on the results. So I would say kind of the, the ecosystem infrastructure one, uh, but also mechanisms to help accelerate in this initial phase uh, the, the scale up by bringing, helping to kind of overcome hurdles to uh, to, to price parity, but again, you know, the, we'll talk about the kind of total cost of ownership. We're already seeing this calibrate pretty quickly, so I don't see it as a big challenge. Martin, mm -hmm. something you'd like to add to this? No, no, I think uh, very much in line both with uh, Commissioner Timmermans and Antonia here uh, regarding what other additional hurdles. I've seen some of the comments coming in the flow also uh, adding up. I mean, it's charging obviously, uh, charging infrastructure for battery electric, but it's also, I mean, having a dense network when it comes to other type of fuels than in particular uh, hydrogen. Uh, but it's also about um, uh, the grid capacity. Uh, it is about green generation of this uh, uh, energy that will not that will not hinder us from do the transformation, but also that we know that uh, everything needs to be green in, in the complete value chain. There, there are not roadblocks, but I think it's more important to continue to have a holistic view of the whole transformation. Um, what we see is that there are a number of um, contraproductive um, uh, proposals coming out, for example, from the Commission, showing that the Commission is still regulating in silos, and not holistically, mm -hmm. and that we need to get hold of uh, quickly in order to, to make this uh, transformation happen. 
We'll get into the different pieces of, of the puzzle, but um, because what Mr. Timmermans has said is that we need the right framework to get zero emission trucks and buses on our roads, and that obviously includes the upcoming proposal for CO2 regulation for heavy duty vehicles. Uh, Martin, what should this regulation look like on, uh, on your view? Uh, and, and more broadly, I think, w how can Europe create the right policy framework to, to support uh, this transformation? No, but, but I think, uh, take, take one example, I mean, uh, take the Euro norms as we knew them. Uh, they served uh, Europe well, uh, up to uh, Euro 6, you can say, because that was not the natural link between, uh, uh, so to speak, the, the financial and economic development. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the competitiveness and actually NOx and particulate matters. Uh, so, so that served us well. Now uh, what is happening is that the, the biggest thing that we have really to do is the decarbonization. And the biggest shift that we can do together is actually electromobility, both battery electric and fuel cell electric. On top of that, and that is important to remember, we are getting uh, a full a scale reduction of NOx and particulate matters. So the answer for us is really to scale this as quick as po possible, market by market, segment by segment, and of course Europe shall take the lead. And that requires, uh, as we have discussed then, uh, that we are uh, putting the right type of firm demands on uh, Europe, the member states and the actors in the transport system. But uh, for example, uh, AFIR, uh, the alternative uh, fuel infrastructure regulation. Uh, there are gaps in that already. We have been discussing that forever. And now it needs to be materialized when it comes to number of uh, charging points, number of refueling points, for example. We have the renewable energy directive that needs to come in place. Uh, we have the, which we are big advocates, is the European or the emission trading system, uh, part two, that is including transportation. So, so it's in incentivizing in a very positive way also that. Uh, uh, the, the, the actors that are doing, uh, that are doing good uh, is, is getting there because that is the TCO parity. And we need to shift everything to, to a price on what is uh, doing harm. And, and I can just say that the Euro 7 legislation that is up for uh, discussion right now is contraproductive, but we can come back to that later on. But these are three elements in addition then to the CO2 uh, framework that will come uh, and it's coming now in the wrong order, by the way, uh, that will come for trucks, but it's not yet presented. So uh, this is important uh, in addition to the others. And what do you expect from, uh, from this piece of regulation specifically? No, I hope, I mean, uh, I, I, I hope and think that we will see targets for 35 and 40. Uh, I think we should have uh, an open view on that. So, so we are also reviewing it as we go along. So, so we are all coordinating all different actors that need to be coordinated in order to make it happen. To Antonia's point, I mean, uh, the technology, but also to make sure that we have charging, uh, green generation, etc. So, so the transition is, is uh, so, so I expect uh, target settings for 35 and 40. Uh, it will be naturally different from, from the core side, but it will be very clear where we want to go and clear reviews uh, uh, also. So everyone is delivering according to, the, uh, to, to their part of the system. Antonia, is there something you would like to add to it? Yeah, I mean, I suppose two, two brief reflections and also just looking at some of the comments that are coming in. So one is, is there is invariably going to be a transition, right, until the point at which we have full zero emission vehicles on the road by 2040, right? So we do need to kind of think about the right sort of regulations and levers that will push the innovation, right, to achieve that target by 2040, but also recognize that we do have um, today uh, emissions, right? So how do we, in parallel, deal with the existing fleet, kind of make sure that existing um, kind of technologies that are continuing to be sold today are as low emissions as possible while also driving innovation into that transformation that we're talking about and make sure that significant capital is going in that direction. The other thing, and, and you mentioned some of the other realities, is that we equally should think about the fact that, yes, we're talking about climate. Um, we're also talking about air pollution, right? So over 7 million people, according to the WHO, die from air pollution annually. It is, it's, it is an incredible challenge, and it is a real one that this particular industry, unfortunately, is, is part of. So how do we, one, yes, set 
the transformation, which will deal with both of these realities by 2040, but really try to drive transition and change today, recognizing that there are people actually suffering um, from the consequences of air pollution today. So, so we can't separate these realities, I think, as well. In particular, yes, in Europe, but I'll also sort of say that for um, the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world equally have uh, to think about sort of the standards and how can manufacturers selling to the rest of the, the world sort of bring the same standards as are e implemented in Europe to other markets, um, irrespective of whether maybe that regulation is, is as high as Europe's as well. So let's think about this, yes, from you know driving transformation into zero emission vehicles, that will take time, but also what do we need to do over the next, frankly, 20 years to deal with the emissions that we see still in the market um, and how do we think very carefully about that the total economic cost here is key, right? We're not factoring in the price of actually the, the, the current neither emissions nor impact on individual health. So how through things like the emission trading scheme and other policy tools, can we really bring in the total cost of economic implications um, that we see in reality today? Because that, that will also really accelerate this transition if we truly do that. We're getting several questions on uh, Slido, and I would like to start picking up uh, on a couple of them that are relevant to our, our topics of discussion. Uh, th the first one of them is actually the most uh, upvoted one uh, by far, so let's uh, dive uh, straight into, into it, because I believe this is a question that uh, many would want to hear an answer uh, about, which is, should an end date for the sale of combustion trucks be set? And if so, when? I mean, we've been seeing a pledge towards uh, 2040, but to which extent does it help? And like, sh should we have a legally uh, binding, uh, binding target on, on that? Uh, Martin, what do you think? First and foremost, I think the pledge uh, that has been set uh, uh, from, from the industry and also together with Potsdam, and we have been working together on that to, to be, uh, I mean, careful in how we formulate it in order to actually deliver on it also, is that uh, by 2040 we should only deliver fossil-free solutions when it comes to the transport infrastructure system. That is often misinterpreted as it is only uh, that we are actually setting an end date for the combustion engine. We don't believe that is wise. Uh, we don't believe that that is feasible in order to make this uh, transition to Antonia's point on a global scale. Uh, also incorporating then the effects of both air pollution, uh, but also obviously then on the climate change issues that we have with, with decarbonization. Uh, we do believe, and I do believe, that the majority, and that will happen now quicker than we anticipate, will, will actually be battery electric and fuel cell electric vehicles then by, uh, based on hydrogen. But there will also be solutions where it is important that we can continue with the combustion engine. Uh, and of course, based again on renewable fuels, uh, where of one promising uh, uh, fuel is actually uh, hydrogen uh, as such. So, so um, uh, put an end date uh, for, for, the, for, for the technology, uh, uh, is unwise uh, and it will be contraproductive. It will not bring significant improvements. Uh, setting an end date for delivering fossil based solution is wise. And, and there we need to do it uh, to Antonio's point, I fully agree. Uh, sector by sector, application by application, because I mean, when we talk about 2040, it is a global. Uh, all in, so to speak, scope, but uh, a lot of these things can happen considerably quicker. We see that now, as I said, in city applications, uh, Timmermans, Commissioner Timmermans actually alluded to it uh, regarding city buses, uh, uh, distribution, waste collection, ports, terminal, etc. Uh, so um, uh, let's make sure that we are driving this shift to fossil free solutions as quick as possible. Uh, and, and by the way, one of the best ways of getting hold of the air pollution uh, is to renew the fleet. We have a far too long tail, uh, still in Europe, uh, of uh, old uh, emission standards and not at least in the rest of the world. So to so renew the fleet also with existing technology will give uh, considerable improvements uh, as well. So not necessarily a target on the technology as such, but on, on the fossil fuels uh, based uh, of vehicles. Uh, uh -huh. That is what we, uh, we, 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 what we need to aim for is decarbonization uh, and take out uh, the harmful emissions, including noise also, by the way, uh, and, and start to regulate the technology has never been wise. 
Uh, I don't know any example where that has been been wise. I mean, innovation is driven actually by that you are setting standards on what we want to achieve, and we want to achieve a society that is uh, prosperous based on uh, transport and logistics, but in uh, a sustainable way, and, and that is what we need to discuss. Antonia, any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm thinking back to some of the analysis from the International Energy Agency, right? And it's very clear that uh, we need to phase out and phase down fossil fuels, right, in order to stay in line um, with achieving the Paris goals. So, so I think that is one key focus and objective that we need to drive. What are the broader system changes that need to require to really draw down our reliance on fossil fuels, which also has energy security benefits, as we saw and see today in Europe in particular, given the war in Ukraine. So how do we focus on that objective? How do we, how do policymakers really think about decarbonizing the entire economy and system, um, stop investing in sort of new, foss new fossil fuel infrastructure investment and, and shift that system? As that happens, that facilitates the ability for all of the sectors of the economy then actually to, uh, let's say, accelerate their integration into a non-fossil fuel economy, right? So it, it comes hand in hand, draw down fossil fuels, accelerate then the transition in this particular sector uh, through the infrastructure that will be provided in terms of the electricity grids, um, the charging stations, et cetera, et cetera. So indeed, I think policy design reliant on technology has never proven to be the right approach. It's really focused on what is the objective at hand in terms of the outcomes and then you create the mechanisms behind it. Technology changes all the time. If we look at solar as an example, a few decades ago, this was a situation where, let's say, there was really good policy feed-in tariffs to help bring down the cost, but actually the policymakers weren't able to keep up and track the cost reductions. And that actually came at a large extent, uh, expense to governments at the end of the day because actually they were overpaying because the technology had, had come down faster than they had anticipated. That was partially because, you know, just anticipating that reduction was difficult, but also um, kind of uh, quite a specific focused technology policy was a good one, but it's difficult to manage and regulate over time. So I think that's where focus on the objective, think about the sort of economic policy tools behind it, um, but also recognize that this is connected to the fossil fuel system, which is making it economically feasible right now to create this competition. How do we draw that down and make the cost of fossil fuel um, recalibrated, I suppose, really? I see. Um, let's let's go back to the topic of, of Euro 7, which, uh, Martin, you've already uh, mentioned earlier. You, you recently warned that the Euro 7 polluted emission proposals risks actually uh, slowing down the transition to zero emission freight transport. Could you tell us why is that, uh, is that so? What makes you think that? No, no but, I, but I think, I mean, when, when we look now at the big shift again, uh, we, we are in a race for uh, decarbonization but also to uh, what we have discussed here, continue to take out uh, the harmful uh, pollutants uh, or emissions, uh, not at least in the cities, and NOx and particulate matters. The best way of doing that, not at least in cities, is to go battery electric or fuel cell electric, right? Because then you take out everything, uh, given also that you work with the whole upstream then system of, of energy generation. What is happening now is, number one, that we are sending a signal that, okay, we are, we are putting a Euro 7 norm that in reality will give very, very gross marginal effect on NOx and particulate matters. In the rolling fleet up to 2035, uh, we know that with the current legislations and with the fleet renewals, we will take out 80%. We will reduce with 80% from 2020. The, the, the proposal is giving an additional 2% from 80 percent reduction to 82 percent reduction. But that will slow down the other big transformation that is going into battery electric and fuel cell electric. So the net effect will be uh, negative. It will, actually, uh, uh, it will actually slow down even for NOx and for particulate matters, and not at least and also for CO2. Uh, so what we are saying is that this is contraproductive. We need to have as the North Star as Johan Rockström said, and I understood also uh, Executive Vice President uh, Franz Timmermans saying, that is the CO2 uh, roadmap uh, that is also containing for our industry uh, actually the acceleration also for re reduction of NOx and particulate matters. 
if we are now putting uh, uh, a legislation, uh, a possible legislation in place, uh, by the way, without uh, clear testing procedures yet, uh, that will come later, we need to redirect again uh, tens of thousands of engineers in this industry back to the combustion engine. Instead of continuing to invest our resources or broadening the range and scope of battery and fuel cell electric and also in certain applications for, for, for uh, renewable fuels. Uh, and that is uh, not good. Uh, that is uh, a mistake. Uh, and uh, that will also uh, threaten, in addition, because if we start with the planet and the outcomes, as we have discussed. But in addition, it will threaten also European competitiveness and, 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 and uh, in the long run, uh, European jobs. And, and why should we not go for the three instead? Uh, strengthen competitiveness, jobs and uh, the right type of uh, sustainability legislations. Thanks, Martin. We need to move to our next uh, section of the of the discussion because all of you have stressed the importance of having a dense network of charging infrastructure that is suitable uh, for trucks. The Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, or AFIR, is meant to kickstart the development and ensure a minimum uh, network for that. So let's hear from Ismail Ertug, a member of the European Parliament, who is also the rapporteur on this uh, regulation, on the outcome of the recent vote at the European Parliament. On the 19th of October, we have achieved a major step towards clean mobility for trucks. The adopted Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, in short, AFIR, will help heavy duty vehicles to get cleaner and thus also make a significant contribution to reducing emissions in transport. Especially for trucks, we have managed to increase the charging capacity in the European Parliament, which means the trucks can charge for a much shorter time and reach their destination faster. This is an important aspect, especially for logistics companies where every second counts and time is precious. A hydrogen filling station is to be built every 100 km, which will give manufacturers of trucks with fuel cell additional investment security and further promote this climate friendly technology. We will start to defend our position in the negotiations with the Council, which is called Trilog, and uh, hopefully the required charging stations and hydrogen refueling stations will be built as of 2025 and respectively 2027. So Mr. Artuk has said for logistics companies every second counts. So how do we ensure that the ambitions from the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation and the truck CO2 regulations are fully aligned? What is needed and how, how do these two uh, relate? Maybe Antonia, we can start uh, with you on, uh, on that. I mean, I think the first just to say that this focus on infrastructure and the regulation is welcome, right? I mean, we talked a lot about this is to say it's one thing to set the objectives in terms of the, the trucks themselves, um, the medium and, and heavy duty vehicles, but actually the backup with this type of uh, regulation is, is critical. So I think broadly speaking, it's a, a very positive and necessary signal. We were getting some comments already from, from Slido. Uh, well, it was a question more than a comment that was saying that the infrastructure is linked to grid capacity. Unless all the pieces of the puzzle are in place, just setting CO2 targets will not help the climate or uh, the industry. Uh, Martin, what are your uh, views on, uh, on uh, that? No, but, but, but first and foremost, I, th I think we need to have a pragmatic view on this. I mean, we have said that we have now technology when it comes to the, the vehicles, right? Uh, now we need really to focus on um, uh, the charging and then we will continue to work ourselves upstream uh, because uh, when we are really scrutinizing, I mean, the different charging points, etc., we will also get questions about the grid capacity. We already see that actually with depot charging capacity needed for, for the, the, trucks, the trucks that we are already deploying in the market. But now we are talking about public uh, charging systems and, and we, will, we will encounter um, uh, roadblocks here and capacity constraints, but that should not be an excuse. So, so we know really well now where we need and how much we need. And Mr. Ertug, I really welcome. I've had a number of conversations uh, with him and some of the colleagues. I think they are doing a very important job in this field. Um, it's 
important to remember that truck is not a car, as I said before, meaning that we need to have different type of locations where the big logistics flows are happening for public transports. We need to have the space requirements because these are 18 or 16 meter long equipage could be even up to um, 25 meters in, in, in certain countries. Uh, and we need much higher uh, charging power, obviously, in order to, to make it happen. Uh, it will be about uh, 800 uh, kilowatt uh, uh, in the near future. Uh, if we look at the transition as such, 230,000 uh, electric trucks will be on the road if we are to really do the transformation, uh, as we have uh, said, uh, by 2030. And that means that by 2030 we need at least 11,000 uh, charging points. And what we see today uh, in, in, in um, AFIR, for example, is considerably less. Uh, let me see here. Um, uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, I had it here. Uh, 11,000 we said, but, but we also see that, uh, I mean, the Commission and Council, uh, they are talking about 4,000 in AFIR, and then it's a gap of 7,000. And I think actually the European Parliament position uh, with uh, Mr. Ertug also is more ambitious, but still a gap of 4,000 megawatt chargers. So here it's very important that we continue to, to work together. I've seen also in the comments here on the screen that um, uh, is the industry doing something about it? We are. The industry is actually coming together to show the way. We have uh, a number of the actors. We have formed a joint venture uh, to put in place 1,000 700 uh, charging stations in the near future. We hope that will attract a lot of interest from other investors to do the same thing. But we really need now to have also the, um, uh, the, the member states uh, signing up for this, both for uh, incorporating and hosting private investors, uh, but also uh, uh, taking their own responsibility of uh, providing land, permits, uh, grid, uh, capacity, etc. And exactly the same story uh, goes for uh, the, the hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, the good news is that we have a lot of data. Uh, connectivity and digitalization uh, provides uh, fantastic opportunities for us to, to see where are the big flows, what capacity is needed, uh, where should we invest uh, together as an industry and as a society. Uh, but here we need to step up big time. Mm -hmm. yes. Just picking up on this, two, two reflections. One is, is you can't have this kind of wait and see approach, right? So as the demand scales in terms of the, the vehicles themselves, and we see this a little bit in the, the passenger vehicle context, the infrastructure has sort of lagged behind, right? But as the pressure comes from the demand side, suddenly the infrastructure is, is catching up. And also that this infrastructure investment isn't only coming from the public sector, right? So it's not just the, the regulation, the public finance is, is not, not going to be anywhere n near enough to actually build all of this. And this is where these partnerships come in. It is the, the, inter the sort of the players in the market and the system who will kind of come in through partnerships at subnational government level, at government level to kind of build this infrastructure together, um, of course, with support from some of the broader um, policy uh, and, and incentives and investments, that's key. But what we shouldn't do is, is sit and think about a, well, we'll move if they move uh, and, and we'll wait for them to move before we really drive investment. It has to be a kind of parallel push, which is really the only way to achieve scale. So it is also about, yes, the regulation in terms of this infrastructure, but also the partnerships that are emerging between players in the system that are already starting to build this infrastructure. At scale is challenging and in hubs, you need that coordination and that aggregation in particular in this segment. Um, but I just I don't want to send a message of well we'll just wait and see because because that won't work. No, and, and I, I hope that uh, it was clear from my side also. That's the reason why we said technology. It starts with technology, I mean, on, on the vehicles, and then, I mean, really to, to uh, look through the, the charging and, and then uh, working yourself uh, upstream, so to speak. Uh, I think the most, you know, this is a personal view, uh, uh, but, but I think the most important with AFIR is actually the commitment of providing the opportunity for a lot of actors to invest, as a member state, for example. So, so I mean, that we are recognizing the fact that we need the capacity of 11,000 uh, charging uh, stations and, uh, and the, the same number, I mean, uh, we will have 60,000 uh, hyd uh, hydrogen powered trucks with, with also, so to speak, the corresponding infrastructure. What we need to have a, a commitment is that private actors or 
private public can actually find the land, get the permits, also having the grid that is often also controlled by, so to speak, the public infrastructure. So again, um, uh, I'm very optimistic when it comes to actors wanting to invest in this. Uh, if I may say so, uh, in particular when it comes to commercial vehicles, because they are utilized. Uh, so, so I mean, and they're coming back and forward. It's a it's a hub to hub type of transportation. It's line flows, etc. So uh, I hope that many will see that it will be an attractive case. And we see that also from both utility energy companies, but also other type of investors that they are super interested in being part of it. But they need to have visibility. They need to have commitments also from uh, the providers of uh, infrastructure. But um, uh, again, I think the message is 11,000 is needed. Uh, now we have uh, different discussions of should it be four or should it be seven? It must be 11, it must be north of that uh, eventually in order to be successful. Perhaps one last question before we move to our uh, next uh, next section, um, because of course when we talk about about the electricity grid, I mean we're seeing you know the electrification of, of, of so many sectors at the same time. So are we putting uh, nearly enough attention to, to grid planning? Uh, Antonia, wh what do you think? I mean, as you say, uh, electrification is such a big decarbonization lever across many sectors, including transport, but also, um, you know, urban centers across many sectors of the economy. So it has to be a critical focus, right? We, we've said that in, in the conversation earlier. Is there enough attention being paid to it now? I think in Europe, yes, uh, not only for decarbonization reasons, but also because of energy security. There have been renewed um, commitments to, to shift towards uh, renewable energy um, and electrification of the energy system in Europe um, over the past few months, of course, um, you know, significant investments in offshore wind, uh, commitments coming uh, from from some of the Scandi Scandinavian countries as well, with incredible deals being done. So I would say, is there enough attention? There's probably more attention than there ever has been now in Europe on on moving towards an electrified um, renewable grid, which will help, I would say, in the context of this conversation. Um, but it is it, it should have really been a core focus. Um, or I would say a, a more important focus two decades ago. So it's it's happening now. Is it happening quickly enough? No. Um, do we now have a, a much stronger impetus and commitment for investment? Yes. Um, is that critical? Of course. Uh, so I think we now really need to make it happen in, in pragmatic reality. Martin, some final thoughts? Uh, no, I, I, I fully agree to, to what has been said here. Uh, I, I think we are getting there, but, but still I think it's too fragmented. Uh, we need to continue to have holistic view on this type of, um, what I normally say, balance sheet for society type of question, because this is the balance sheet in order to make the transition happen. Uh, and um, uh, we are getting there, uh, uh, but, but uh, not at least when it comes to grid capacity and to see, so to speak, the whole transformation of different industries at the same time. I don't think we have the full view there. Will we ever get that? I don't know. That's the reason, again, why I think it's so important to go three-folded uh, also with the fossil-free uh, journey for transportation, uh, because in some areas it will be these type of constraints. We should not have then the excuses. Then we should utilize other solutions in order to make the fossil-free outcome uh, a reality. All right. Now let's just let's listen to the voice of a customer. Um, we're going to be hearing from Amazon, which is one of the biggest players in the transportation uh, business, in which they'll be explaining what they are doing to achieve zero emissions from their difficult to abate middle mile deliveries. So on with the video. I would like to explain Amazon's commitment to and engagement on sustainability and specifically our actions and ambitions towards road transport with a focus on what we call the middle mile, that is long haul, heavy duty transport. Amazon's scale comes with a responsibility. We know that our employees, our customers and our partners want us to not just contribute, but to lead on sustainability and preserving our planet. This is what drove us to co-found the Climate Pledge, our commitment to become net zero carbon by 2040 across our entire business, 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. We are on a path to power our operations with 100% renewable electricity by 2025, and last year we achieved 85%. To help reach net zero carbon by 2040, Amazon is transforming our fleet and transportation network, and zero emission vehicles play an important role. 
For heavy duty transport, we rolled out fully electric 40 ton trucks in the UK earlier this year and will have 20 more such vehicles in service in Germany by year end. At the same time, we are trialing hydrogen powered trucks as well and see it as promising technology. And we are scaling fast. Last month, we announced plans to invest more than a billion over the next five years to further electrify and decarbonize our transportation network across Europe, delivering packages to customers more sustainably. We will use this investment to increase our European fleet from 3,000 currently to at least 10,000 electric delivery vans and more than 1,500 electric HDVs. We believe this investment can help drive innovation across the industry and scale up production, which will also help the broader transportation industry reduce emissions faster. But while our intentions are big, our ability and that of our partners to deliver on our commitments and the Green Deal is directly linked to the speed at which zero emission vehicles and infrastructure for alternative fuels are made available across Europe to users and customers like us. Regulation plays a key role in sending signals and creating investor confidence in zero emission vehicles at the EU level. At the heart of such a regulatory framework are initiatives such as the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulation, AFIR, and the CO2 emission standards for trucks. That's why we have been vocal in supporting high ambitions to accelerate the shift towards zero emission vehicles. AFIR creates a pan-European charging and refueling network this is key to us, our partners, and our peers in the transportation and logistics industry. It allows us to charge along the main transport corridors and serve our customers wherever they are. Given the speed at which vehicles will roll out, we are urging policymakers to commit to an ambitious timeline and to increase the minimum capacities for charging pools and fast chargers. The CO2 standards for trucks are another key part of this framework. The upcoming review can send a strong signal to manufacturers and customers on where the sector is headed. This will help to achieve economies of scale for clean trucks for mass adoption. But let's be clear. For the logistics sector to fully embrace zero emission trucks, us customers expect that next to equal total cost of ownership the technology needs to offer the same kind of flexibility as fossil alternatives, without deeply disrupting route planning and driver hours, allowing the business to operate effectively. With high ambitions, cooperation becomes even more important. We are seeing great signals from OEMs about bringing zero emission vehicles to the market at scale. It is the responsibility of the logistics sector to step up and show that the demand for these vehicles is there. Amazon is keen to work with all stakeholders, policymakers, OEMs, CPOs, network operators to jointly develop the right framework for an accelerated rollout of zero emission heavy duty vehicles in the EU. Thank you. So the message is clear that in order to embrace zero emission trucks, the logistics sector needs equal total cost of ownership and equal flexibility for its operations as fossil alternatives. So, I would like to hear uh, some reflections from, from the two of you. How can this be realized uh, in practice? Uh, maybe Antonia, you'd like to go first? Certainly, I mean, I think it's important to note that if you look at maybe not the, the trucking sector, but the, the consumer segment, that total cost of ownership for electric vehicles is, is expected to be reached uh, by 2025, and that for the medium um, duty vehicles, we are expecting to see that between 2028 and 20. 31. So, so first, just to kind of note that that we're pretty close, actually, to achieving that objective. So, from an economic standpoint, it it will make a lot of sense. Now, the reality, though, is everything that was just described and, and discussed is in order to feasibly integrate and adopt these systems. Uh, this is where, as was sort of called out, we need the right infrastructure in place and 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 the the consumers at the end of the day uh, need to be able to continue to operate their businesses as, as has previously been the case. So you need the full system. Now, 
how do you accelerate some of that? I mean, yes, we talked earlier about the regulation and the infrastructure regulation, but I mentioned earlier also this notion of creating demand, right? So if you can get more companies like Amazon and others to set these types of ambitious commitments um, that they will transition uh, their fleets, they will move to moving their goods and services using um, zero emission vehicles, it continues to send these signals to uh, the producers that act and, and also the infrastructure uh, investors that uh, there is a ready-made market actually as these solutions come to bear, which equally helps to start bringing down those costs. So to your question, I think I'm not too concerned about total cost of ownership parity being reached anytime soon. And if we really continue to drive the demand side of this agenda, which we're trying to do through the First Movers Coalition by having Amazon and other companies like it set clear targets, it hopefully will unlock the investment also on the infrastructure side as well. So it's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of how fast can we do it um, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Martin? No, first and foremost, I think it's very interesting and encouraging to listen to, to Andreas uh, uh, Marshner in, the, in, this, uh, in this clip, talking about I mean, their ambitions. We see that uh, from many of our customers, more and more actually. Uh, I, I fully uh, agree with Antonia's uh, view on uh, different type of levers from the corporate sector. Uh, that I think is an advantage also for trucking because uh, it's both our direct customers, but their customers' customers also pulling this. Uh, they have pledges for science-based targets that are very ambitious, where when they are doing their CO2 mapping, actually see that logistics and transport is a um, pretty big part of their CO2 footprint, but that they can abate even with an extra cost. So I think the TCO parity, when people start to set the price on carbon also, uh, internally in the corporate sector as well, will actually see that it's a pretty big, big a good business case to actually bait that type of uh, CO2. Uh, that is number one. Uh, we also happen, I mean, in my capacity as CEO of Volvo, we are all, uh, actually one of the uh, founding members of uh, First Mover Coalition. We really see how that is internally driving our efforts, how we start to think differently about the TCO. Uh, because, I mean, one of the questions that we see is obviously often, okay, how can I afford it because it's a higher capex uh, for, for uh, an electric, battery electric or a fuel cell electric truck. Yeah, that's true. Because you are exchanging actually a, a, a thousand of liters of uh, diesel over the life cycle with the battery and the electricity. Uh, but the reality is that capex is higher up front, but OPEX is lower. Uh, so, so we need to be better also pedagogically describe how does the total cost of ownership per kilometer, per month, whatever, really looks like. And that, I, I think we are getting there segment by segment. Now, what is more important is also to make the confidence that to uh, Andrea's point, that there will be infrastructure uh, where it's needed, that they can plan uh, the driver times. Uh, now we have, and we will see now, uh, I mean, the ranges of up to 500 kilometers, then it will actually be the driver resting times for safety that will play the role. So, so we, it's the system view that is important. The TCO parity, uh, in many cases, I think will actually be more um, uh, easy and clear to explain because it's a B2B game. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Commissioner Timmermans or Executive Vice President Timmermans said actually, I mean, many of the customers are utilizing a calculator and they are. And it's the same calculator to be used if you're big or small. Uh, but also what is interesting, uh, a lot of them are utilizing a, a, a calculator, but are also utilizing their heart. And they want to change the game. They want to be part in this transformation, mm -hmm. both direct customers and also customers' customers. Because we've got a question coming in. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you immediately, Antonia. Uh, th we, we have one of the most uh, avoided uh, questions that says, how can a fleet owner or a freelancer pay two to three times for a truck, considering no grants, because not all countries would necessarily uh, grant it? Some, some reflections here? Um. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about the total cost of ownership, and I think what we're saying here is that total cost of ownership um, is expected to, to balance out, as you said, the OPEX versus the CAPEX. The CAPEX, um, as you renew and also currently is more expensive, this is where we, we, you know, there is also the opportunity to provide incentives actually for this transition if we really want to accelerate, accelerate it, which governments are doing um, across Europe in certain cases uh, for consumer vehicles. There are incentives and there have been incentives for consumers 
not only sh to shift to electric vehicles, but also to support the infrastructure um, that's required to charge. I've just benefited from this in, in purchasing an electric vehicle in, in Switzerland as an example. So I think one of it is, yes, there is a recognition that the, the kind of initial cost investment um, can be higher, but I don't think for necessarily a lot longer in all cases. Um, and, and the use of policy instruments to help bridge that gap as the technology cost comes down will be really beneficial and helpful, I think, as the question asks is, how do you, how do you balance the reality that you know, those who are actually buying these fleets may not actually have the capital um, to deploy to, to these types of solutions, despite a desire? Um, so looking at some of those instruments will be key. I think the other thing I just wanted to quickly add is that, yes, there's total cost of ownership calculations. But again, let's look at where we sit currently in, in an energy crisis, right? We're in an energy crisis um, in Europe right now. The cost of fossil fuels is, is very high and increasingly volatile. It's not necessarily the case that this is this predictability um, won't be maintained. I think we are going to be in an increasingly volatile space when it comes to, to energy prices. So yes, you look at the kind of calculation of total cost of ownership, but equally looking at the security that's connected with the type of vehicle that you're running and a sudden spike in operating cost, actually, which is the case now, has an incredible implications on the overall cost to the business. So yes, it's you know some of these calculations aren't always predictable <laughs> in the way that they're done, um, and these other factors I think will just even shorten uh, the rational case for investing in these types of solutions. Which, by the way, also will be one of the uh, factors why um, battery electric and hydrogen electric will go hand in hand. Because at the end of the day, with renewables that we all embrace, it's a, it's a storage uh, uh, issue as well. Uh, but we will find the, the right solutions of that. We see now, for example, that uh, with digitalization, we can follow exactly how our windmills are producing. Uh, I mean, not only when it's not blowing, but also in certain uh, type of operations when it's not making sense, actually, produce energy because you cannot store it. So, 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 so we will see much more of this type of total cost of uh, operation for society as a whole, including uh, the energy generation and, and the price on carbon. Uh, but again, coming back to this question, uh, I mean, as I alluded to, uh, what I think is important also to acknowledge, obviously, during a certain period of time before, I mean, uh, technology majority uh, is there, I mean, volumes are ramped up fully, etc. That is a very efficient way for 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 for, for um, society to give a gentle push in the right direction, and we have seen a number of uh, tools that are working really well here. Um, I mean, incentives we have talked about, of course, for customers, and I think the fleet renewal. Uh, schemes. Uh, I mean, to really renew the fleet, we have seen a number of these uh, solutions uh, coming in also from 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 the audience. Very efficient. Uh, also efficient for pollutions in cities, as we have discussed. A uh, very, very good way of, of uh, driving both the decarbonization but also other emissions. Uh, we see road tolls uh, has been playing a very important role uh, because that is another way of incentivizing the right type of investments. We see city access, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, a cost, but it's also driving a shift. Many cities are doing it. We need to have standardization so, so we know what technologies that are coming. So many tools are available. I think the financing is very important also because it's easy to say, I mean, in reality, TCU is the same, but for the CapEx part, you need to find also convenient solutions for not at least for the smaller and uh, medium-sized operators to get that access. Of course, most of uh, the peers uh, have customer finance, but we need to think about the green parameter of that financing. And then obviously, the, the ultimate is to continue to be more effective on the price on carbon, both when it comes to the public price on carbon, uh, but also when it comes to the corporate or private price on carbon. And I think it's encouraging that more and more uh, customers and customers, customers that we see in our industry are actually incorporating that in their investment uh, decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. Now, before we move to our uh, very last segment of uh, today's discussion, we only have just about 15 minutes uh, left to go. There is a one question that's been uh, particularly upvoted by uh, many users, which, uh, Martin, you've already briefly uh, mentioned the, the role of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen power trucks, uh, trucks. but uh, maybe we can like, address it in a bit more detail. Where do you see hydrogen IC trucks uh, in, uh, in this context? Uh, maybe, Antonia, you would like to have some thoughts on, uh, on that. I mean, I would say there's 
there's quite a lot of controversy around the use of hydrogen for different applications, right? I mean, I think it's fair to say there's a bit of a hype, hydrogen hype happening at the moment. Um, so I suppose the way I look at this is, is let's be smart about what types of energy sources we're putting into what types of uses and deploy those solutions in a way that is both physically efficient, but also economically efficient across these different systems. So, you know, for applications like decarbonization of heavy industry, hydrogen makes good sense, right? It, because you need that that um, high temperature heat. In, in other types of sectors and segments, it might be a solution, but it may not actually be the most efficient and effective solution when it comes to kind of the physical transformation of um, of these systems. So I think that's sort of how we think about it and, and look about it, uh, look at it as well in this way. Thanks, Antonia. Yeah, Martin. Uh, no, uh, first and foremost, I mean, uh, I fully agree. Uh, I, I think from time to time it could be a little bit uh, theoretical because, uh, I mean, uh, you have the obvious sectors where hydrogen, for example, should be needed. You have the obvious sectors where electricity should be needed. And then you have a number of sectors that are a little bit in, in between. Uh, uh, how should you think about it when it comes to aviation, shipping? Uh, I think also on the heavy duty transportation. And that's the reason again why we uh, would like to continue to drive the outcome also in cooperation with other sectors because I mean uh, we need to do uh, to your point so, so I fully agree but but I think we will see uh, applications where actually hydrogen both than fuel cell powered electric or hydrogen ICE powered it could be remote areas where you don't have the charging or you don't have the grid capacity you, when you have a local production actually of hydrogen uh, and that storage uh, it could be heavy duty transportation uh, logging, forestry, etc., where where that will have a good debatement anyhow. So, so, so we need to think uh, practically about it, outcome-based, uh, and also taking, I, I agree, other sectors into consideration. So, so we are not uh, not uh, uh, optimizing in the wrong way. But my conviction again: battery electric, fuel cell electric and uh, combustion uh, with renewable fuels and uh, wa where hydrogen uh, could be. We think that the absolute majority will be battery electric and fuel cell electric, but uh, uh, we need everything to, to be for free by 2040, right? So we have heard from the perspective of one industry CEO today with, uh, with Martin Lundstedt, but let's hear now a compilation of different videos of some more CEOs or CTOs that have been in conversation with policymakers from around Europe. On with the video. I think from my perspective, it's all about the planet. It's all about getting rid of the carbon dioxide that our industry is emitting. So, so of course we need to be part of the solution. We know that the green transition is the key to prosper for people and planet. We also know that we are in a hurry. So it matters what we do now. Meeting the targets necessitates close cooperation of all the major global manufacturers with the focus of alternative fuel technologies battery cells and clean fuels. I remember those guys, experts, who told us that it will be never possible to have these kind yeah. of trucks in uh, with hydrogen, but now I see it. But nevertheless, don't forget the electrical side. We need both technologies. This is my firm belief. I'm less worried about the vehicles. The manufacturers will provide the vehicles, but I'm more worried about infrastructure. Availability of green energy, availability of charging infrastructure, we are aware that all deployment of zero emission trucks cannot be accelerated without adequate charging infrastructure. Heutzutage haben wir ein sehr moderner Euro 6 und haben weiterhin auch noch über die Hälfte der Flotte in Europa, die noch älter ist als Euro 6. Jetzt steht schon Euro 7 an. Wie stehen Sie dazu? Ich finde, es geht jetzt alles zu schnell. Jetzt gerade wegen der gesamten Wirtschafts- und Energiekrise in Europa müssen wir vieles neu überdenken. Wo Energiepreise explodieren, wo die Herstellung und Produktion enorm herausfordernd ist, und zwar für ganz Europa. Deswegen sollte die Europäische Union jetzt nicht einfach stur ihren Stiefel durchziehen, sondern sie sollte an der Stelle mal maßvoll und langsam herangehen. Also wir brauchen jetzt eigentlich kein Euro 7 mit Stand, sondern eher so ein Euro 6 mit leichter Verbesserung. But we need everyone in the EU, because our customers don't care, because they have to deliver loads wherever their customers want them to drive to. We talk to our customers. Of course, the first thing they worry about is Am I going to be able to make money in my business when I shift over 
the challenge going forward is to make sure that our customers, the transporters, the logistic companies can take the risk, so to say, to move over from the fossil platform over to this zero emission platform. So to have that kind of vision for them from politics is very, very important. We've just heard some interesting dialogues between uh, industry leaders as well as uh, policy makers on, on the topic that brings us here together uh, again, right? How we can accelerate the, the deployment and the scale up of zero emissions trucks. So I would like to ask the two of you from, from some final reflections based on what we just heard and from our entire uh, whole discussion today. So Martin, why don't you get us started? Yeah, first and foremost, I think it has been uh, a very important and good discussion. Uh, I think uh, uh, try to see this uh, change and this shift from uh, different angles, which is uh, very important. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, from time to time we tend to tackle complex uh, problem, problems with, with simple solutions. In this case, it is not uh, a simple solution. It is actually actors coming together to work. And that's the reason why uh, I think the first one here that is important on this reflection is that the decarbonization road transport requires more than a C CO2 regulation of vehicles. That must be there, obviously, we fully agree, but it requires more. Uh, it requires also that we are moving away very quickly from uh, 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 a, a silo way of working when it comes to the re regulatory landscape that is dangerous and that can actually hamper. We see that now when it comes to um uh, Euro 7 that we have been alluded to, uh, that we are actually risking to, to actually slow down the transition of electromobility, that we are moving back uh, engineers to, to combustion engines uh, with very small effects. Uh, and, and that can also even send a signal that we really don't believe in the full transition. Uh, so, so don't send that signal. We need to send the signal that we believe in this. Uh, that is very important. And also that the, the enablers are uh, maybe the most important important role for policy makers to play when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to charging, when it comes to grid capacity, etc. Uh, and on a final note from our side in, in the industry, we are all in. Uh, we started with our pledges here. Uh, we are all in when it comes to actually materializing our plans in research and development, in industrialization, uh, also playing our part in charging. We want to move from this fossil-based brown platform up to a green platform uh, together with everyone that can be part of it. So count on us. Uh, and it's about TCO, it's about technology, it is about charging and infrastructure, and it is about uh, having the courage to do it together. And uh, that is what we want to do. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Antonia, some final reflections from your side? Certainly. I mean, I think Martin covered much of the, the discussion very well. I mean, we heard it in the video. We're literally moving from a fossil platform to a zero emission platform. And, and as was said, this isn't just sort of shifting individual pieces of a system. It's changing the whole system. And so to change the whole system, you need to work with all the parts of the system in tandem in order to actually do this at the speed and the scale required. And I think just to, to say that's very much what um, our Road Freight Zero collaboration is about. It's about kind of connecting the parts of this value chain to figure out how you actually kind of advance the nuts and bolts of this transition. Um, and then having FMC as that demand pull to help us really drive it forward. So, so I think for me, that's really the, the key message. But also, um, don't kind of hold down on, on that ambition. Let's come back to Johan, who spoke at the beginning. Um, this isn't a political negotiation around what's possible. It's a reality that we are hitting physical boundaries when it comes to climate change, that if we don't address um, a whole slew of increased tipping points will be hit, and the impacts that we're already seeing today from climate change will only accelerate and exacerbate the impacts, in particular on, on the, the most vulnerable people in the world. So let's just keep what we're dealing with at the forefront of our minds as we're setting these ambitions. Yes, there's always sort of technical challenges, issues we need to address, but I think the key thing is, is it's possible. Uh, we just need to really work together and drive towards that ambitious goal at the end of the day. Right, in short, uh, just to finalize, uh, as we have been saying, uh, the European Commission is expected to prepare a proposal for heavy duty vehicles CO2 regulation for the turn of the year. Uh, what would your three wishes uh, for the European Commission be? What would you like to see happening uh, happening there? Maybe Antonia, we can start with you. 
Certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll say it briefly. So the first I, I just said is sort of hold firm on that ambition, right? So keep the ambition high and, and keep that aligned with science. Truly an opportunity for the European Union to be at the forefront of this, this global shift when it comes to the sector. Um, we've talked about the holistic approach, right? So again, this is not just uh, looking at the, the zero emission trucks themselves, it's actually looking at the transformation of the entire system in order to fulfill that objective. So it's not just about the target at the end. Um, and, and equally harmonization, I think the harmonization across, and this is why actually the commission playing a role here is so critical. Uh, you need harmonization across all of the member states um, in these different areas to actually make this transition viable and, and quick, right? So the, the kind of collaboration harmonization on the levels of ambition, on the targets, on the all of the different ecosystem pieces that we've talked about uh, to keep pace will help then the whole logistics system transform um, because it's obviously not confined to one country in Europe. Um, it moves across the continent. So those would be my three key points. Martin, very short. What are your three wishes? No, no I mean, I, I think we all uh, see the urgent need of really making this transformation happen. We owe that to coming generations and to the planet, right? And, and for us, again, coming back to, I mean, technology is there. Uh, we need to have uh, an outcome-based, uh, so to speak, regulation that is going hand in hand, different type of regulations. Don't do CO2 uh, regulatory. It should be ambitious. We are supporting that. Uh, but it should not be in isolation with other uh, regulatory landscapes. And also, I mean, the, the full supporting, so to speak, ecosystems for that. Then we will succeed. And finally, uh, when we have identified what is required in order to move from this fossil base to the zero emission platform, uh, we need to hold, held, hold everyone accountable to, to make their part, because accountability is coming with also the, the need of execution. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Martin. So, well, it's time to wrap up this discussion. Thank you very much to the speakers that have joined us today. Antonia Gawel, Martin Lundstedt, and thanks to all of you for the many questions and for all the activity that you've been generating uh, online with us. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to cover all the questions, but I hope that this event has been interesting and insightful. At least I, that's the impression that I get out of this event. Now I'd like to give the floor for some concluding remarks to Ms. Sigrid de Vries, the Director General of ASEA. Indeed, what a great event it was, a great contributions and a great discussion as well with such clear reminders too of why we are discussing today just after COP27 and there's a real urgency uh, to act. The European uh, truck manufacturers are pushing ahead. They are leading the way in the transformation to carbon neutrality and uh, the commitment to fossil free freight transport by 2040 is a major North Star. And that's also what we heard today, for example, from Professor Johan Rockström, who said if this sector can decarbonize successfully, then that's really a strong signal to other sectors and also other regions. Yet, he also said, this industry cannot do this alone. It's a complex transition. Um, there needs to be maximum focus from all parties involved, and it will also take time. We heard from the EU Climate Commissioner, Frans Timmermans, who also echoed this very, very much. He said, we need to build the right framework to get zero emission trucks and buses on the road and to help them to replace fossil fuels very quickly. And it was already mentioned a couple of times today, he said, freight companies buy trucks with their calculator and a little bit with their hearts, I think Martin then added. Um, Ismail Ertug, we heard about the European Parliament rapporteur on the infrastructure regulation. In commercial transport, he said, every second counts and time is really precious. So we need to get this megawatt charging network also established. It's really crucial to get this transition on the way. We heard from Amazon, Andreas Marschner, who was really crystal clear. He said, we want to embrace zero emission trucks, but in order to do that, we, the logistics sector, need the same total cost of ownership. We need the same flexibility as that we get from uh, the fossil fuel alternatives. We need to be in business, uh, in my translation of his words, to change our business. 
And then, Antonia, thanks also to you very much from the World Economic Forum. We heard you plead for a holistic approach and to also really keep the global perspective in mind. It's about system change of a huge dimension. And before the end game we're all working towards, there is really a huge transition to manage. And policies need to be objective driven, not prescribe uh, technologies. Martin Lundstedt, our chair of the Commercial Vehicle Board in ASEA and of course also CEO of the Volvo Group, had some very positive messages for us today. Vehicles, first of all, are not the biggest issue in this transition, he says, but he also pointed out that trucks are really not like big cars. They need a tailor-made approach and regulations need to be aligned to get things on the way. CO2 infrastructure, uh, emission trading scheme, also renewable energy, and of course, Euro 7 pollutant emissions. They all need to work into the same direction, um, and that is decarbonization uh, rather than cause counter, um, uh, counter effects. So to sum up, um, we have our North Star, zero emission vehicles will rapidly become the backbone of road transport if conditions allow it. And banning internal combustion engines is nothing but a symbol and it will not accelerate the transition, whereas by working together we can make it happen. So I'd like to thank all of you, but also our speakers, Johan Rukström, Andreas Marschner, Ismail Ertug and Franz Timmermans, of course, Martin Lundstedt, Antonia Gawel and our moderator, Anna, thank you for doing a, a great job. And I invite you all to have a look into the great efforts of our truck and bus manufacturers. For example, by uh, logging on to our social media campaign, you see the hashtag today also everywhere, hashtag zero emission trucks. It's truly impressive. And on that positive note, I'd like to close this event. Thank you for your time and have a good day.